welcome to all who are online. <coughs> um, I'm certainly keen to hear uh, Neil's presentation today. Um, some of the some some states have lots of spinifex grasslands and um, uh, predicting um, my behaviour in these spaces. Is, has always been a problem. So um, Neil's been at the heart of a lot of this work uh, over the years, and um, to see this latest enhancements to the model uh, is really, really uh, pleasing. So Neil, I'll hand over to you. Um, thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that intro, Mike, and thanks to AFAC and Greg for organising this webinar. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll get straight into it. Hopefully my toolbar will work. Um, so yeah, look, as Mike alluded to, I've been working away on um, developing uh, progressive models of uh, spin effect fire behaviour for quite some years now. Um, this is probably version three or four of, of Lost Track, but um, hopefully each version gets better and better. So the purpose of the presentation, basically three things I want to try and get over today. One is give you a bit of an understanding on how the model was actually developed. It's an empirically based model, so it's field based, um, but I'll just walk you through that. I think it's important to understand how fire behaviour models are developed. It gives you a bit of a, an insight to their limitations, I guess, and, and strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'll talk about how the model works, the, the algorithms or the equations in the model. Um, the, it's a parsimonious model, meaning it's a fairly simple model, as most empirical fire behaviour models are. And then I'll talk a bit more about how to measure uh, the model inputs. Um, by and large, this is a, a work in progress while we know how to do the measurements in the field for F-bands who are operating in incident management teams at a control centre or whatever. Um, quite often, it's in most cases, you're not going to have access to, to field information. So I'll talk about how we're trying to, to overcome that, but it's certainly a work in progress. Um, as um, Mike alluded to in his introduction, the spinifex uh, grasslands or spinifex fuel is the largest vegetation type or fuel type in the country. It occupies about 27% of the continent. Um, spinifex occurs in all mainland states, uh, predominantly of course though in Western Australia, Northern Territory and South Australia. Um, while it's a big chunk of our country uh, and the largest fuel type in the country, um, it doesn't get that much attention from, a, I guess, a fire behaviour, fire ecology, fire management perspective for the simple reason that it occurs in, uh, mostly occurs in the remote parts of the continent that are fairly sparsely populated. Um, and yet it has some of the largest wildfires on the globe occur in the spinifex grasslands. For example, in 2012, we had a fire in, uh, in our Western Australian component of the spinifex uh, that was about 3.2 million hectares. Um, two years ago, we had another 5 million hectare fire. So, so bushfires of this scale are not uncommon. Uh, and every year, somewhere in that um, yellow patch, we're, we're seeing fires in excess of 100,000 hectares. But they usually go unreported because they usually don't um, impact on communities and settlements or, or anything of value. Um, most information, most uh, interest I get is usually from NASA scientists who detect these sort of hot glows in the middle of Australia and, and email me wanting to know what's going on there. It's usually a massive spinifex fire. Uh, of course, spinifex is a common name given to um, uh, a group of uh, plants, grasses um, by the, of the genus Triodia. Plectractin used to be in there, but they're now all Triodias, and it comprises some 70 odd different species of. Triodia. Okay, we'll just move this forward. Uh, as you can imagine, being such a widespread fuel, it, it occurs on a, a great variety and diversity of land systems and soil types from sand dunes, sand plains, right through to, to rocky hills and, and mountain ranges. Um, what is in common to these sites is that uh, spinifex or triodia is the dominant fuel type or vegetation type uh, and is, uh, provides the basis for uh, fire spread in these landscapes. 
for the most part, fire management objectives in Spinifex lands, whether it's um, private property or Crown land or, or nature reserve or Aboriginal land, um, are fairly similar to fire management objectives in, in any fire prone environment. Um, certainly for us in the West, the, the first objective is to mitigate the impact of these massive wildfires um, that, that threaten assets, and there are assets in the arid zone, semi-arid zone, that I'll talk to in a minute. But our first step is to, is to try to develop ways of um, reducing the scale and intensity of these fires. The, uh, in my view, these uh, Spinifex fires have not always been um, large and severe, uh, as we see today, when Aboriginal people were more commonly on the land living a traditional lifestyle, um, we've got um, significant evidence that their patch burning uh, significantly buffeted the impact of these wildfires. It didn't eliminate them, um, but it certainly reduced their scale and intensity and severity because they were doing a lot of burning um, for a whole range of reasons. Um, we certainly use, it, uh, use fire as a habitat management tool. Um, in fact, um, large wildfires combined with introduced predators in the semi-arid and arid zone um, uh, has contributed significantly to the decline and loss of a number of species, particularly uh, medium-sized mammals and ground-nesting birds and the like. And of course, on pastoral leases and um, properties that run stock, uh, fires used to manage forage. The key strategies that we employ are prescribed burning. Um, certainly in WA, our capacity to put out Spinifex bushfires is fairly limited. Usually they occur in remote, uh, poorly accessible areas. They usually don't threaten assets. So for the most part, those fires go until they burn themselves out. And in some cases, that can last for three or four or five weeks. Um, we do have assets, despite my comment that the, where Spinifex occurs is by and large remote, um, sparsely populated. Uh, there are assets in this part of the world, in this part of the country, um, particularly with mining infrastructure, uh, and that seems to have proliferated uh, in the last 20 odd years, certainly in WA. We have not only townships, but infrastructure, rail, road. Um, we have mining camps scattered throughout the country. Um, and uh, exploration camps. In fact, um, not so long ago, one of the mines in the Pilbara was, was uh, lost about $75 million uh, in lost product, product production as a result of a bushfire that closed the mine down. Uh, so it had significant impact. We've had several near misses of exploration camps uh, and FIFO mining camps from bushfires. It's quite amusing to me that the mining industry are particularly conscious of safety and risk factors, but they don't seem to consider bushfire as a serious risk, although a couple of these camps that had near misses have, have changed their, their tone on that. Um, and of course, um, pastoral leases, um, big bushfires have significant impact on, on their infrastructure and their, their, their browse. Um, it impacts, as I mentioned, on um, fauna conservation or conservation values. And it also can impact on remote com Aboriginal communities, um, of which there are many scattered throughout, certainly the Great Western Desert and uh, into South Australia and the Northern Territory. So there are assets there. Um, but from uh, my agency's perspective, one of the key threats to these big bushfires is on conservation values. So just a bit about Spinifex for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, it's a live fuel. Uh, it's discontinuous, as you can see from the shots there. Uh, the, uh, in a, a mature Spinifex meadow, the ground cover range is from anywhere from around 35 to 70%, uh, commonly around 50%. It does have varying proportions of dead fuel. Uh, generally, the proportion of dead fuel increases as the meadow ages with time since fire. Because of its physical arrangement uh, and final foliage, etc., uh, and sometimes with the resinous spin effects, its chemical composition, it's highly flammable. Um, I've characterised it, if, if it was continuous rather than patchy, I've characterised it as the perfect uh, bushfire or wildland fuel in terms of its physical structure. Uh, generally, Spinifex meadows exist as fairly simple structures, uh, a ground cover of Spinifex, to varying degrees um, with scattered shrubs and, and on occasions there might be an overstory of mallee 
um, or trees such as marble gum. Um, generally, they can occur as pure meadows. Um, more commonly, though, they usually uh, have a, a, a mix of around you know five ten percent cover of, of shrubs. The the fuel is characterised by me as anything that's under about one point five metres um, above ground. The structure, like all fuels, the structure of spinifex changes, and its characteristics as a fuel change as it ages with time since fire. So soon after fire, it starts life out as a, uh, a, a dense um, clump, dome-shaped clump. And then as it ages, uh, because it grows out radially, generally the middle of the clump, uh, the middle of the plant uh, dies, the old, the old parts of the plant die off, and it can move into sort of donut shapes. And then as it continues to age, um, parts of the plant die off and the, the growing front continues on, and you can end up with these big crescent-shaped formations. So it changes its structure, as all fuels do. So just turning quickly now to how the, the model was constructed. As I said before, it's an empirically based or field based model. Um, over the period of 30 odd years, we've, we've lit something like 186 uh, experimental fires. They've mainly been, almost all been line ignition. Um, as you can see the map there on the right, we've um, carried out fires in most of the desert Ibras in Western Australia, but we've also managed to get hold of some data, thanks to Paul Williams, from um, some Queensland spinifex. Uh, lines of fire, 50 to 100 metres, we started out at 50, but with the work of Cheney et al. some time ago, we moved the lines out to 100. Um, we allowed the fires to burn for about 50 to 200 metres. Um, a couple of occasions we didn't contain them how we thought we might, and I think the longest run we have is about 1.8 k's. Um, but we separated out 36 of those fires, put them aside, didn't use them in the construction of the model, um, but we used those to validate the model. So it's a fairly standard procedure. We go out there, we find an area to, to do the experimental fires, an area that, that we can contain the, the spread of the fire to. Um, we do ground measurements of the fuel, uh, cover, um, patchiness, um, biomass or fuel load, etc. We uh, fuel moisture content, we light the, light the fires, we record the weather and the fire behaviour and we crunch all those data through various statistical packages to come up with a predictive model. Um, there's much more detail about the methodologies, etc. in a uh, recently published paper that was co-authored with, that I co-authored with um, Malcolm Gill and, and Jason Sharples. So I won't go into much more detail if you're interested in following the the detail of how we constructed and analysed, etc., the model, um, its its accuracy, etc. Um, I refer you to that paper. So, but um, the the first step, well, I guess, there's three steps in in trying to understand or model or predict the behaviour of fire and spinifex grasslands. The first step is to determine whether or not the clumps are dry enough to burn, and the moisture content of spinifex. Um, we've found I've fiddled with, around with all sorts of ways of trying to characterise that. But I found the most reliable way is to actually measure the average moisture content in a clump, including dead and live material. Um, I know a lot of um, fire behaviour models, such as shrubland models and the like, <coughs> pardon me, the focus is on the moisture content of the dead material. But that doesn't work very well for spinifex because the dead material um, forms um, varying proportions of the fuel load depending on fuel age and physiological development from less than 5% through to 15%. So we just can't use the moisture content of, of the dead fuel. Wish we could, that'd be so much easier. We could just use temperature and relative humidity uh, to predict the moisture content of the dead fuel, but um, we can't do that. So um, we found that once the average moisture content of the clump drops below about 40%, the clumps will ignite, which is most of the time spinifex is uh, ignitable or flammable for, for most of the time during the year. Um, so once you've got ignition, the next question is, will the fire spread? Uh, once you've decided, uh, yes, it will spread or no, it won't. Um, if it does spread, if you've decided that it will spread, um, the next step in the, in the predictive process is, OK, if it's going to spread, how fast is it going to go and how big are the flames? It's a, a classic um, go, no go fuel, as all patchy fuels are. Uh, and unlike continuous fuels such as, say, a forest litter, um, uh, the only threshold to fire spread in, in a continuous fuel like forest, forest litter is moisture content, but in discontinuous fuels, 
there are a number of thresholds to fire spread, which I'll I'll um, I'll move to. So um, first step is will fire spread from from our research. We found that it depends on various combinations of, and this won't be a surprise, wind speed, fuel cover as as me measured as a percentage of projected um, ground cover, and, and the moisture content of the spin effects. So varying combinations of those things will determine whether or not spin effects will spread. Uh, we've come up with this um, fairly simple linear equation that links those things, wind speed, um, fuel cover and moisture content. I'll call it the spread index. It, it is a um, unitless measure from logistic regression um, and it basically enables you to plug in different combinations of wind speed. I should point out the wind speed there is measured at 1.7 metres or about eye level. Uh, fuel cover and fuel moisture content. It will generate a, a spread index. If the index is greater than zero, um, it's highly likely that the spin effect, the conditions are, are right for spin effects for fire to spread. If the spread index comes out to be less, excuse me, less than or equal to zero, it's unlikely that the conditions are right. The thresholds haven't been exceeded, and it's it's unlikely that spin effects, uh, that fire will spread in the, in that meadow. So that's the first step, and it's important to go through that step because the next step, which is uh, about calculating the rate of spread, um, the data used to develop that model were data from only only from those fires that spread. So rather than crunching all the no spreading fires into that that equation, we separated out the no go fires from the go fires, uh, and the next equation, which is this thing, was developed from the go fires. So you need to go through that that step one process. Will it spread or not? Yes, it will. Okay, now we can go to this equation to find out how it might spread. Uh, and the equation there, as I said, it's, uh, again, it's a fairly simple relationship in wind speed, fuel cover, and moisture content. Um, slightly nonlinear or weakly nonlinear. Uh, we managed to get a pretty good relationship. The R squared value there is, is pretty tight. Um, so uh, that's from 150 of those 186 fires um, that were used. And when we tested the model against the 36 fires that we didn't use in model development, um, the R squared dropped back to about 0.78. So still pretty good. Um, once you've got rate of spread, flame height can be predicted from that, uh, uh, as well as fuel consumption or fuel load uh, by that that that, uh, that relationship there. Um, we found that uh, I was a bit surprised that fuel load didn't turn up in as a significant factor in predicting rate of spread. It was there, but it was really really weak. And in, in the interest of trying to keep the model fairly simple, um, we chucked it out because uh, it wasn't contributing much to the accuracy of the model. Um, I, I thought fuel load might be important because it's, when you're watching spin effects fires, um, certainly in heavier fuels, the flames are taller, um, uh, and you would think that uh, it might uh, encourage, well, facilitate um, more rapid spread. But certainly, statistically, it didn't seem to add much to the, the rate of spread. Um, and clearly, from that graph, you can see under our experimental conditions, at least, um, spin effects flame heights seem to level off at around about three or four metres. Um, they tend to get longer uh, as, the, as the fires get faster, um, but we rarely got flame heights much greater than about four, four to five metres. OK, if I can just now turn to measuring the model inputs. The most important input, as with all fire behaviour models, is the wind speed, once you've got ignition, and once you've got spread, uh, is wind speed. Uh, we found that wind speed uh, explained around about 70 to 75 percent of the rate of spread, so it it it, it consumed a fair bit of the, you know it's a, it's a major factor uh, as you might expect. <clears throat> Measuring wind speed in the field, um, obviously you can use your Kestrel at 1.7 meters or about eye level. Um, we were we, we suggest measuring getting an, uh, an average wind speed over five minutes, so you can program your Kestrel to do that. Um, indirect measures, um, working in some very remote areas, we actually found MEDI and uh, specific spot forecast requested of the Bureau while we're doing some of these experiments to be pretty good. But um, as with all uh, forecasting, um, trying to f uh, accurately forecast wind speed in particular, I got the wind direction pretty right, but trying to forecast wind speed in, uh, in particular is problematic, but I think that applies to 
to most situations, not just the arid zone. Um, I'll just make a note here that um, the model is developed on 1.7 metre wind speeds. Uh, forecasts, uh, as you know, are given in uh, for 10 metre um, standard open 10 metre wind speed. So um, to change the model parameters, of, you need to change that coefficient, the coefficients there, as, as I've shown, the SI coefficient and the rate of spread uh, wind speed coefficient. Now, this um, wind speed ratio reductions um, are based on Cheney's grassland work. Um, I haven't actually tested this or um, validated Cheney's grassland wind speed reduction ratios for spinifex grasslands, but I suspect they'll be fairly similar. Uh, but that's a, a job for me to do it sometime down the track is um, just to get some 10 metre towers out somewhere and, and just see what, um, what the wind speed reduction is. Um, the next import, most important um, factor in predicting whether fires will spread or not and if they do how fast is fuel cover uh, as a percent of projected ground cover. Again, in the field measures, I refer you to that paper, we go to some detail in explaining how we measured it in the field. Um, but again, if you're an F-band working at a, uh, on an incident at a control centre somewhere, um, usually these fires are remote. Uh, you're not going to be able to get out there or probably unlikely to get, get any measurements from the field. Um, so we're looking at indirect measures. Um, as I said earlier, we're, that's still much, uh, pretty much a work in progress. Typically, in most fuels, indirect measures of fuel cover or fuel characteristics are linked with time since fire. Uh, and I'll show you the sort of relationships that we've generated w with, um, with time since fire. Uh, but we are also making some pretty good progress uh, with remote sensing um, using Landsat and Sentinel satellites. Uh, we're, we're able to generate maps of spin effects cover. Um, not quite as simple as that, but we're, we've made some really good progress on that. And in, um, sometime soon, I hope to get some, some information, perhaps a pu uh, publication out on uh, how to generate uh, maps from remote sensing, that uh, generate maps of spin effects cover from remote sensing. But um, you can see the problem with using time since last fire. Um, spin effects, uh, the, the rate at which it develops, uh, and, and go through its structural and biomass changes. Um, time since last fire is only one factor. The other factors, of course, are rainfall and local site factors, particularly soil factors. So it's not a, trying to predict spin effects cover from, <coughs> excuse me, time since fire is not very reliable. But it might be all you've got, and it'll probably do. I've got a note there too that in some meadows, we've observed that spin effects <coughs> cover can actually decline with age. Um, after about 30 odd years, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, fuel load, which is important for calculating flame dimensions. Uh, again, you can do that in the field, rather tedious, and most of our operations people don't, don't, don't bother because it is a, a tedious process. Um, or indirectly, again, from time since fire, um, and from fuel height and fuel cover. The little pick on the bottom right there, we're now using um, copter drones, uh, to take stereo pairs of spinifex meadows and some of my clever colleagues are able to uh, very quickly convert those images into three-dimensional images from which we can calculate cover, height, volume uh, and then fuel load from drone imagery. But again, you need to be on site to do that. Uh, again, as you can see, as with fuel cover, fuel load, trying to predict it from time since fire is fairly unreliable because of the, the, the issue that um, the way that spin effects develops is, is not just about time since fire, but it's also about rainfall and local factors. Uh, we have got a relationship there that, that improves prediction somewhat um, by if you can access um, cover and height, um, that little linear relationship there gives a pretty good, is, is, makes a, a pretty good stab at um, predicting fuel load. Uh, this slide just illustrates how, um, as Spinifex ages, you can see this has moved to a situation, it's a pretty old meadow, it's moved to large crescents. Um, there's the odd small pump in there that's re that, that has regenerated uh, in between fires. Um, but over, overall, this, the, this meadow has, has gone to, it's about a 
25, 27-year-old meadow, it's starting to uh, reduce in terms of its cover and its biomass as it moves out into these large um, crescents. Um, I should say that there's not much spin effects that looks like that because usually it gets burnt before it gets to that stage. Um, a few of the difficulties, um, okay, turning now to fuel moisture content. As with most fuels that are, that are um, predominantly live fuel, including some shrublands, etc., cetera, um, trying to predict moisture content is somewhat problematical. Uh, and spin effects, I've already mentioned, uh, it is a live fuel, but it has varying proportions of dead material in it, depending on it, how old it is. Um, we know the dead fuel moisture varies depending on temperature and RH. Uh, but the the overall moisture content of the fuel complex is a is is a function of both alive and dead material uh, and the various proportions of each. At the moment, we don't have, and I don't think there there exists for any predominantly live fuel type um, reliable um, moisture content prediction models for for these sorts of fuels because the live component of the spin effects, obviously, as with any vegetation type is largely determined or depends upon the moisture content of the soil. Um, before I move to more explanation about um, indirect measures of calculating moisture content, I need now to, to, to talk a little about the, um, the four or five categories of spin effect, arch spin effect architecture or spin effect structure um, that we use to determine um, indirectly, fuel moisture content. Uh, in front of you, you can see fuel class or category two, category three. Uh, these categories uh, are based around that um, the structural changes of spin effects as it, as it develops with time since fire. Uh, well, I haven't put fuel class one in there because that's the really uh, early stages. Uh, generally, it doesn't burn, it's not flammable. Um, but you can see the descriptions there. Fuel cl class two, six to 10 years. And that age, that um, age range is there because of the uh, variability associated with cumulative rainfall. Um, basically, the hummocks are quite discrete. They're compact. Um, some are joined. They're just starting to join up. Um, but uh, the level of, or the amount of, importantly, the amount of dead material in these relatively young hummocks is fairly low. It's, it's, in terms of biomass, it's under about 5%. Um, but then we go to fuel class three, you can see the description there, it's starting to age, you're seeing the black spots develop in the middle of the rings as the older parts of the plant die out, starting to get more and more uh, dead material in, in the plant. Then to class four and onwards to class five, which is um, class five being a, quite an old uh, meadow where the, the rings, are, even the donuts are starting to break down and we're starting to see uh, large crescents form and significantly uh, significant proportions of dead material as, as uh, illustrated by the, the grey or black, black coloured material in those slides. So that, that's sort of um, a classification or categorisation of the structural changes, both in terms of uh, the shape of the, or the architecture of the meadows, but also in terms of the component or the composition of dead material in there. So um, Back to bearing those structural changes or those fuel classes in mind, back to indirect measures. And one of the ways uh, our field people are, uh, again, you have to be in the field, but one of the ways they can determine it, moisture content is by the color of the live needles. Um, and uh, spin effects has this capacity, almost like a resurrection plant. Um, when the soil moisture is high, uh, it's, the live needles are, are bright green. And then when the soil moisture um, dries out basically to almost zero. Um, the uh, needles turn quite yellow, uh, and then when the uh, when it rains, the needles turn green again as the as the um, photosynthesis factories crank up. So it's it's quite a quite a remarkable plant in terms of its adaptation to arid zone. So we've um, we've just got these four colour codes um, and and an approximation of the the moisture content. Now this is for a class two fuel, so we're um, looking at a fuel complex or a standard fuel that has a uh, little or low proportion of dead materials, predominantly live, live material, either live, live leaves or live stem um, with small component of dead stuff. So that becomes the standard. Um, 
So for the standard or class two field, you don't need to make any corrections to those values that I listed on the previous slide. But as the, the fuel, if you're dealing with a much older fuel, the leaves are probably going to be the same color for a given set of um, soil moisture situations. But because of the higher proportion of dead material, we have to make corrections to the, the fuel moisture content. Uh, and basically those equations there, which include relative humidity, um, enable you to make corrections to the fuel moisture content for different classes of fuel. So it's accommodating or, or accounting for the increase in level in um, dead material as the fuels age. And I've given a worked example there, which, which I won't go through. You can go through it at your leisure at some other time. Uh, we found this to be pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's within probably five or so percent. Unfortunately, the, the way I've constructed the equations, it's possible for the moisture content to drop to very, very low levels. That's why I've got um, the proviso in there. If you calculate it out to be less than, say, 14%, then set it to 14. Um, the other interesting way of doing or calculating or estimating remotely uh, or indirectly fuel moisture content is using the Australian Landscape Water Balance Model. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I've got the website listed there. You can go and check it out. Um, I'm also aware of a model, soil moisture content, or soil moisture water balance model called Jasmine, um, but I haven't looked closely at Jasmine yet to know how well that will predict the moisture content of the live components of the spinifex. Um, but certainly the um, Australian Landscape Water Balance Model, which is a joint effort between Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO, uh, is showing some promise, as you can see from the little graph there. That, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Um, we, we're doing some more work on that, but that is, that's looking good. So the, if you're not familiar with it, the um, ALWB model is um, uh, national. It's a national predictive model for soil moisture content. We use uh, the predictions of soil moisture content uh, at the uh, root zone, which is down to about a metre into the soil. Uh, it's on a 5K grid, so it's fairly high resolution. Uh, and it's daily. So um, if all else fails, you can get onto that website, put in your lat longs or some other uh, geocoded reference uh, and find out what the, um, fuel, the soil moisture content is at, in the root zone based on the, their modeling. Uh, and um, then using that sort of relationship there, you can correct back to what the moisture content of a standard or class two Finifex meadow would be. And then, of course, if you're not dealing with a class two meadow, it's a much older meadow, you have to make those corrections um, for the amount of dead material uh, using relative humidity, uh, as I outlined in the previous slide. And the other indirect measure we're looking at is remote sensing, uh, NDVI. Um, this is obviously being used across the country for um, estimating um, curing of grasslands more generally, um, but we're doing some work at the moment here in the West with the Department of Fire and Emergency Services to um, see whether we can calibrate this for spinifex. Um, given that um, there's a few issues with spinifex, mainly the level of reflectance that comes from the bare ground. Uh, it's a, you know, uh, average spinifex, mature spinifex covers probably around 50%, so you're looking at 50% ground reflectance. But again, it, it's showing some some uh, potential, and I'm hopeful that in in the next few months uh, we will have maps like you see there on the right, um, but calibrated for um, spin effects. Uh, and in particular, at the moment, the because it's calibrated for annual grasses, once the curing drops below it is less than 50%, well, well, that's the minimum curing it goes to because basically. Normal annual grasses don't burn if the curing is less than 50%, whereas spinifex certainly will. So we need to break, that, break up those categories from 0 to 50 into finer classes for spinifex. And that's about all I have. Um, I just want to acknowledge my um, collaborators in this project, Malcolm Gill, Jason Sharples, uh, Paul Williams from um, Queensland, and technical assistance provided by Bruce Ward, Alex Robinson, Graham Lidlow, and Errol Toons. And uh, as I say, the, the next, the developments we're currently working on are to um, progress those uh, methods for remotely um, estimating or determining fuel moisture content uh, from satellite imagery 
uh, and also from uh, remote, for remotely sense uh, uh, estimating fuel cover again from satellite imagery. Uh, once we we get there, I think we'll be we'll be uh, have, we'll have a a tool that will be more useful to F bands and and others using or who want to know how fire fire spread and spin effects um, than we've got at the moment. We've got the model, but we just need to make the um, uh, to develop systems to make the inputs um, more practical, more feasible. So thank you very much. Are there any I'll questions of Neil? I'll just play the, um, put the line into the unmute mode, Mike. <clears throat> All participants are now unmuted. Thanks, Deb. Um, are there any questions of Neil? Yeah, good day, Neil. I've just got a question in relation to um, the post-fire response of the spin effects. You showed the slide of the 27-year-old meta, which was basically a series of uh, crescents with very discontinuous fuel. How does that respond to the fire? Does that sort of come back with a sense of cover, or, or how does it how does it go? Yeah, look, um, good question. We earlier on in the uh, the research, we we tried to accommodate. So so even though the the, the cover can be same, but the structure architecture, the spin effects changes. So we tried to look at ways we could measure that, but we didn't come up with any anything successful. And so just using straight cover seems to pick it up reasonably well. But I think if we wanted to improve the predictability, yeah, we could probably the no. ways of taking account of different structure architectures and effects. Are you online? Uh, the of the, of the account. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? Your question? Yep. Far away. Are you, you're talking to me, Matt Plachinski? That's right. Okay, sorry, I got a big bit of background noise. I wasn't sure. Yeah, there is someone's got the TV or something in the background. They might need to mute their phone. Oh, that's better. Okay, I've got Miguel here, and, and he's asked a couple of questions that I've typed in uh, about fuel cover. Um, is it only spin effects, or the fuel cover variable also include um, spin effects and other vegetation? No, the fuel cover actually includes um, any vegetation that's under about 1.5 metres, mm -hmm. is where we've sort of drawn the line. Um, but in most cases, certainly in my experience, in most spin effects meadows that I've worked in and they've been restricted or limited to WA, I guess, um, of the the fuel cover, spin effects accounts for about um, 80 or 90 percent of it. Uh, but you will get some meadows that have anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of non spin effects vegetation. But if it's under 1.5 metres, we include that as part of the fuel cover. Okay, so they're, they're fairly rare. The, um meadows with other vegetation? Yeah, but it, the dominant vegetation, this model is really designed around the dominant vegetation, and by dominant meaning that 80 to 90% of the fuel, or the fuel cover, is actually spinifex. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks for that. Any, any other questions? Yeah, g'day Neil, Andrew from Queensland. Um, be very interested in uh, mapping using Sentinel. So it's a 10 metre um, resolution uh, you're using for spinners. Yeah, for that's mapping. right. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yep. Be very keen to um, see that. You say you're about to publish something. Uh, we we hope to have something out in a couple of months. Um, as I said, I'm working with um, Department of Fire and Emergency Services on that with their remote sensing people on that and. Um, it's looking pretty good, but um, we have got a couple of months more work to do yet. And as soon as that's done, I'll, I'll make sure, perhaps through AFAC or, or whatever, the net, or through the FBAN network, that I circulate that information as well. That'd be great. And uh, the relationship between fuel load and rate of spread is fairly weak or non existent? It's weak, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, it didn't, the, the statistical software we were using. Um, it didn't uh, meet the entry requirements to the model. 
uh, which I was quite surprised at actually. Earlier models I had included it, even though I knew it was weak, I thought it was important because I, I, uh, it just looked like it in the field watching Spinifex fires spread when they hit heavy, when it was in heavy fuels with these massive flames. Um, but I think what's happening is, okay, the flames get high or tall, um, they can become more buoyant, but they don't necessarily um, breach the gaps because to breach the gaps in Spinifex, you need, the flames need to be long uh, and lay down. Um, so I think that's what's going on there. So no, it didn't show up, uh, it was showed up weekly um, as a predictor of rotor spread, but um, the main fuel characteristic was cover. Yep, um, and just a war story. I was talking to some of Paul Williams' crew last week up in far north of Queensland, and they did some burning around the Mount Isa Airport in March after 370 mil of rain. Yep. And six hours later, they had a um, a ripping prescribed burn. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing stuff. Yeah, yep. they did have good buffle cover in between. Yeah. Um, the clumps, but yeah, they yep. had that actually floated a bit. It was the, definitely the the spin effects that was carrying the fire. Yeah, uh, and that, that's the other proviso or precaution um, I would add here. Um, this model, once you've got a continuous fuel, if you like, and that is, and that can happen where you get things like buffalo grass or even native herbs and grasses infilling the gaps between the spinifex clumps. Um, I don't know how well the model worked then, and occasionally if we get uh, uh, in some of our deserts, we get good wet, good um, winter rains and good summer rains. We'll get obviously get herb growth and soft grass growth that growth that fills in between the hummocks. So you're not dealing with a continu discontinuous fuel. Now you're basically dealing with a continuous fuel, which is probably going to behave more like a grassland fuel than a than a spinifex fuel. So that that yeah. just needs to be wary of that. Yep. yep. That was my next question because I noticed all your photos were there was just uh, bare earth between the clumps. Yep, that's right. And and for the most part, certainly in our neck of the woods, that's what it looks like. But uh, I I do know and I have seen where we've had big rainfalls, particularly um, winter and summer rain. Uh, those clumps, those bare areas will often fill up, uh, and then I suspect the fire is going to behave more because it, it's, you know, it's going to behave more like a continuous grass fuel rather than a discontinuous spinifex fuel. Um, but the other interesting thing about the Queensland data, um, I know um, Paul sent me data from some work he did around Mount Isa, and um, I was just blown away. Was, I think he's working in 10 or 12 year old spinifex meadows. Uh, just blown away by the, the cover, the height and the biomass. It was so much bigger and heavier and greater cover than the spin effects I'm used to working in. Um, but then I looked at the rainfall for that area, the average rainfall for around that Mount Isa area is about, I don't know, four or 500 mils or something. So it's probably uh, parts of Queensland where spin effects grow uh, is probably parts of its wettest range that it occurs in that and probably the bottom end of the Kimberley in WA. For the most part, in the interior, Spinifex occurs in areas where the mean average or the mean rainfall is around about 220 to 250, um, but importantly, it's highly variable. But where you guys are in North Queensland, you, you know, it's going to develop much more rapidly because of the much higher rainfall there. Yep, thanks, Neil. Uh, may I add a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Is that Miguel? How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was the accent, mate. <laughs> I know. Uh, I just uh, listened to that um, question about the fuel load, and uh, it's very similar to the results we got for the grass uh, fuel load study. Very interesting. Uh, my question was: What was uh, your range of fuel loads in your study? Okay, um, so again, it's in the paper, but it ranged from about three, from memory, I've got the paper up in front, about, about three tonnes per hectare uh, to about 20 tonnes per hectare. Um, but well, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, I'll qualify that. In terms of the experimental fires, the, it ranged up, up to 15 tonnes per hectare. Uh, but we have measured fuel loads uh, in some spinifex meadows up to 20 tonnes. But they're very, very unusual. They're usually um, they're, they're small meadows that occur in spots of deep soil, um, relatively high rainfall, such as we get up in parts of on the um, lee side of range, mountain ranges in the Pilbara, in the, in the um, 
in, for example, the uh, Karajini National Park. Um, but normally the, the average fill load was about seven through the range of experiments, but it can range from about three to about 12, 15 ish. But uh, again, Miguel, I think I've given those ranges in the paper. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Neil? I'll take that as a no. Um, thanks very much, Neil. That was really interesting, and um, I certainly look forward to trying to implement that the, the model and, and validate it for, for my part of the world. Um, as Neil mentioned, there's the papers out in the la in the International Journal of Wildland Fire, and if not, chase Neil if you want more details. Yes. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Actually, just before you go, um, Mike, if uh, you or anybody else is actually doing any burning in, in Spinifex, um, if you've got the time and the energy, I'd really appreciate some data, um, certainly the inputs to the model data, because uh, the more information we can get to independently, uh, I guess, validate the model, the better the model, be, model will be. And um, I, there's another acknowledgement. Um, I should like to acknowledge uh, Miguel's contribution, he was one of the referees or reviewers on the paper and um, his contribution made the paper uh, much better. So thanks Miguel. No worries. Um, that's all for this, this time. Uh, just a reminder that if anyone spread the word about listening to these, joining us, and if you've got any interesting topics, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike.